This is Duke University. I'm Rachel Hinchcliffe of the Environmental Defense Fund. I'm one of the project managers that helps to run the Climate Corps program, of which many of you are very familiar, intimately familiar. And it's my extreme pleasure to welcome you all here today. We're really excited. We have a fabulous agenda. Um, and so to kick us off this morning, I'm going to introduce Dan Vermeer, who's the executive director of the very new, brand new EDGE Center. That's the Center on Energy Development and the Global Environment. And he'll introduce our two keynote speakers. So welcome. Um, so, we're here today, we actually made it. For those of us who have been planning this over the last several months, it's a really exciting day. It's a thrill to see all of you here. So, welcome to Duke University, uh, and welcome to uh, I, uh, what I'm sure will be a really exciting day. Um, we uh, were um, really intrigued by the possibility of bringing together about 100 people who have spent the last several months focus night and day on issues of energy and climate and really um, create an environment for all of us to share um, ideas, experiences, insights with each other um, so that we can sort of take advantage of each other's experience and finding a way forward on a really critical agenda in the world. Um, as uh, Rachel said, my name is Dan Vermeer. Uh, I'm the director for the Center for Energy Development and the Global Environment. We call it the EDGE Center. Um, which uh, officially launched this week. The press release went out Monday. So you are here at the very early stages of what we hope is going to be a great institution. So um, and I think this kind of event is a signature for us in the sense that we're really interested in bringing together professionals and students around these critical issues of energy and, and environmental sustainability to find ways to accelerate and move forward on pathways for a prosperous and sustainable economy. Um, so, uh, I'm thrilled that we're here, that we're able to do this event as part of our uh, launch of EDGE. But I also would like to acknowledge that um, we certainly have not done this alone. We have two core partners, Rachel and the Environmental Defense Fund and her team, um, which really uh, you know, are the critical enablers of this event, having driven the Climate Core program and brought all of you to the table. Um, we're we're uh, really, uh, I think, lucky to be able to tap into the kind of momentum that they've already created around this. Um, and, and find ways to, to add to that. Uh, I also would like to uh, acknowledge the Center for uh, Globalization, Governance, and Competit Competitiveness, um, CGGC, which is a center here at Duke run by Gary Jareffi, um, uh, and who uh, in includes Lucas Brunn. Um, CGGC has been a critical partner in this process all along as well, and um, so the Really, the three uh, organizations have worked together to, to make this day a reality. Um, I'd like to thank, um, as I said, EDF, the core team of Duke. I think there's several people who, you know, when I said, hey, let's bring together the Climate Core folks and their host companies for a day of interaction, said, yeah, that sounds all right. They had no idea what they were signing up to in terms of the, the level of planning and detail to really put together a great agenda. So I really appreciate uh, Kira Fabrizio and the other Duke faculty who have been involved in this, Tim Searles, who has been um, working with us on the IT and media portion of this, and you'll see how critical that is in a moment. Um, um, and, uh, and I'd also really like to thank the um, two corporate sponsors that really made this day possible. Ingersoll Rand, uh, and we have Mike Lamock, who's the CEO of Ingersoll Rand, who will be um, with us and sharing some of his um, thoughts on energy efficiency, and uh, the Eaton Corporation, and Dan Gisser is um, here representing them, and I think there's some other Eaton folks who are in the audience as well. Um, so the objectives for today, the first one is to learn from our experiences and glean the key insights that all of us have had working on these kind of issues in the, in, in the industrial sector, trying to drive energy efficiency and hitting all of those systemic barriers that we all know are so common when you try to drive these agendas. Second is to enable all of, all of you to learn from each other. So this is less presentation from the stage and more sort of a parallel process because everyone in the room is an expert. Everyone has experiences to share. So we really tried to minimize the sort of the speaking from the front and en enable as much 
interaction as we can. Um, third is to identify strat uh, strategies for accelerating energy efficiency in industry. That's not the whole space. There's residential and lots of other sort of dimensions of this question. This one's really focused on how do you do this in, in the corporate environment. And finally, opp identify opportunities to work together to drive this agenda forward. We hope that this is not a one-off. Um, so we don't have any explicit plans. We're not going to unveil something to you at the end of the day. Really, this is what we wanted to do all along. We're really looking to see what emerges. So I encourage all of you, if you want to be part of an effort to, uh, to drive this forward, to engage in research and more of this kind of interaction, if that's something you're willing to put time and effort and thought into, let us know and let's see what emerges over the course of the day. And um, so um, not a hidden agenda here, but one that we really hope is not just today. We hope to build on it. What is the energy efficiency opportunity? Um, this is not new. It's been around for a long time. I don't know how many of you saw John Stewart's um, piece recently where he sort of reviewed presidential statements going back, at least to Jimmy Carter, talking about how critical and timely energy efficiency is. Jimmy Carter said, ours is the most wasteful nation on earth. We want uh, waste more energy than we import. Uh, with about the same standard of living, we use twice as much energy per person as do other companies like uh, countries like Germany, Japan, and Sweden. Um, so a call to action in 1977, and here we are today. So I think, you know, that's one important thing. This is not an easy nut to crack, and it's not new. Um, but it is still an untapped opportunity, and I think that's what's intriguing to us, is that um, this is still so attractive as an opportunity if we can figure out the way to work around those kind of barriers and uh, inertia that exist. Just to pulling a quote from Time um, last year, this may sound too good to be true, but the U.S. has a renewable energy resor resource that's perfectly clean, remarkably cheap, surprisingly abundant, and immediately available. It has astonishing potential to reduce carbon emissions that threaten our planet, the dependence on foreign oil that threatens our security, and the energy costs that threaten our wallets. This miracle juice goes by the distinctly boring name of energy efficiency. And it's often ignored in the hubbub over alternative fuels, the nuclear renaissance, T. Boone Pickens, and the green tech economy. Clearly, it needs an agent. But it's a simple concept, wasting less energy. Um, so I think it's simple. It's compelling um, and doable, but I think we really have to get focused and understand the best practices about how to do that. Um, this is not only about energy. Energy efficiency is a really critical component in any strategy to address climate change. And, and uh, you know, you are members of the climate core, so it's important to keep in mind that those are really integrally connected to each other. Um, an international energy agency study said last year, uh, Energy efficiency can deliver 65% of world carbon cuts in the energy sector by 2020, 54% by 2030. This means that in 2020, energy efficiency could have almost twice the impact of renewable energy, nuclear power, and clean coal combined. So when you think about the amount of rhetoric space and mind space and buzz that exists in our world, around those other elements, and then you realize that energy efficiency alone is double the potential in terms of uh, reducing carbon of all of those combined. That's pretty powerful. Um, you know, I'm struck, my own experience, I, before coming to Duke, I uh, worked with Coca-Cola in the Environment and Water Resources Department, and I would go to plants and ask them, so have you guys thought about energy uh, efficiency or water efficiency efforts? Like, oh, absolutely, would you like to see our 2000 plan? 2001, 2002, they're all right here. None of them got funded. We didn't do them. They weren't you know, approved in the capital allocation process. The company saw other things that were more worthy of investment. So we didn't do them, but we have a plan for every year. So we're happy to share that with you. Um, so it's that systemic issues. What are, what are those kind of barriers? There's a whole set of barriers. Some of them are organizational. Um, so the high upfront costs of capital, the split incentives that capital um, budget owners and operational budget owners are split. Um, the reward systems, very few people make uh, uh, you know, big bonuses because of energy efficiency. Um, I guess we're uh, calling back our folks. Um, and I'd just like to cite one study, Gail Bo Boyd, one of the professors you'll uh, meet later today. 
Okay, good. He's back. Thanks, Peter. We'll introduce you in a moment. He's behind screens. <laughs> um, uh, mentioned a, a study that they had done in Europe where they compared companies that had good management practice uh, and uh, correlated that to you know, positive business outcomes like you know, labor productivity and safety record and energy e efficiency. And those things were very highly correlated, not hugely surprising. Well-managed companies achieve good outputs. Um, they've done the same kind of study in the US, and they found very similar results with one exception. Well-managed companies still don't have good outcomes when it comes to energy efficiency in the US. I think that's a really provocative finding that maybe the issue is not just a matter of how hard this is in organizations generally, but maybe the management paradigm in US companies actually has a blind spot around energy issues. And I think all of us have experienced that in, in, in many ways, is that sort of blind spot of even really well-managed companies that have their act together on many fronts don't really still grasp the sort of um, core issues around uh, energy efficiency. There are also many psychological barriers. People um, don't think systematically about, uh, about efficiency trade-offs. And you'll hear from Rick Larrick and some of the other par uh, panelists later today about the psychological barriers. So why now? Energy efficiency is more important than ever. We're poised on the brink of enormous increases in demand for energy. So efficiency could not be more important than it is right now. Um, we can expect energy prices to go up, perhaps dramatically. Certainly a lot of uncertainty around that. Um, we uh, also know that while climate policy is lagging, there is a lot of regulatory um, efforts around energy efficiency. Um, not just in the US, but globally. Um, so there's a lot of drivers that make this the issue of today. So how are we going to try to crack this nut today? I want to give you a little sense of the outline. Um, we're going to try to be loose and as interactive as possible, but let me just talk uh, through the basics. We're going to start with a session we call Climate Leaders in Conversation. We've asked um, two uh, experts in the climate and energy space, Mike Lamock from Ingersoll Rand and Peter Senge from MIT. Um, I'll give you a little bit more background on them in a moment, um, but the two of them we want to engage and really bring sort of uh, a bifocal approach to th understanding energy efficiency issues. We're then going to leave this room. We're in this room because it has the telepresence capability, but we're going to spend most of the day over in a room called Faculty Hall, and you'll have 15 minutes after this session ends to get over to Faculty Hall. We'll give you more logistics as we go. Over in the other room, we're going to have a series of panels. And the panels are on motivation and identification for energy efficiency, led by Rick Larrick. Um, we're then going to break for lunch. We're going to have Bill Shemides, who's the dean of the school, uh, Nicholas School of the Environment, um, join us um, and um, share some thoughts on this issue. After lunch, we're going to come back and talk about financing. It's great to find these opportunities, but how do you finance them? That session is going to be led by David Robinson, another one of the Duke faculty. Um, third panel is on implementation and benchmarking, and Gail Boyd will be leading that session. And then we'll wrap at four. You'll have a little bit of breathing room, and then we'll go over to the Thomas Center for uh, an open reception. We'll have a few um, comments from Gary Giraffe and others there, but a chance for all of us to compare notes and see what came out of the day and see where we want to take this. So um, I wanted to uh, give you a little sense on this climate um, leaders in conversation. We're doing a bit of an experiment. We have a sort of a unique opportunity to have two really stellar presenters that are that joining us in this first, uh, this first session. Um, one of them that's here in the flesh, one of them that's here virtually. And what we want to do over the next um, hour, hour and a half, is engage in a conversation with these two experts around issues of energy efficiency um, and really hear their perspectives. We're using the telepresence system, and that's not accidental. Um, one, it's a great technology. Um, and uh, it's relatively new, so many of you maybe not had experience um, with uh, telepresence before, so uh, it's very experimental in the sense that I've never run an event where we're using telepresence as extensively and interactively as we're going to do today. So I ask for a little bit of patience and a little bit of an experimental mindset about this first session that we approach it. There may be moments of awkwardness. There may be sort of challenges in terms of trying to work across the seams of virtual space. But I think it's a really important question that we want to. There. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm really sorry. I think it was a little volume. I don't know what this is here. I'm very sorry about that. I lost the video signal. OK. I'm a little listening. So 
Hi, everybody. I'm <laughs> sorry to right now, but I am able to follow. No problem. Okay, great, Peter. And hopefully we'll, we'll have you back uh, um, live on the video <laughs> when we get to it. As I said, it's an experiment. <laughs> so I've just proven out on that. I want to hang up and move on. Okay, let's do that. While I do that, I'm going to give you a little back, a bit of background on, on Mike and Peter. Um, really pleased to have Mike Lamont um, here. He's not only the um, CEO of Ingersoll Rand, um, which is one of the sponsors for today, but he's a Duke graduate. And so we are thrilled to have him back on the campus. Um, you know, go blue. So, uh, so I think uh, he comes with uh, qualifications at several levels that make him a really appropriate person for this session. Um, Mike serves as the Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Ingersoll Rand, who was previously the Chief Operating Officer. Um, prior to these roles, he also served as Senior Vice President and President of Train Commercial Systems at Train Company in Ingersoll Rand, and President of Security Technology se Sector. Prior to coming to Ingersoll Rand, Mike was at Johnson Controls for 17 years, <coughs> serving in a variety of roles. Um, those included Group Vice President and Managing Director for, for Europe and Asia, so a real global um, experience. Uh, uh, group Vice President and uh, General Manager of Customer uh, Business Units and Vice President and General Manager of Controls Group, uh, where he led Johnson Controls Integrated Facilities Management Business. Um, um, Mike received his bachelor's degree in engineering from Michigan State University and a master's degree uh, in business administration from here at Duke. Um, I'll ask Mike to come up in a moment, but before I do, I'd like to introduce Peter Senge, who's been hiding in the telepresence, but we'd like to acknowledge that he's here, he's part of our session. Um, Peter, many of you know, um, he's had some interaction with all of you, I think, in, uh, through the EDF program. Um, Peter is a senior lecturer at MIT. Um, and the chair of the Society for Organizational Learning. Um, he's probably best known as an, uh, an author of several acclaimed books, including The Fifth Discipline, The Dance of Change, and most recently, The Necessary Revolution. Um, uh, Peter's lectured extensively throughout the world, translating ideas of systems theory uh, uh, into tools for better understanding of economic and organizational change. He consults to leaders in business, in governments, in healthcare, and many other sectors. Um, he was named uh, one of the top 10 management gurus by Business Week, and Wall Street Jun Journal included him as one of the top 20 most influential business thinkers. So uh, a, a real thought leader in the space. Um, and he received his um, Bachelor in Science from, uh, in Engineering from Stanford, an MS in Social Systems Modeling, and a PhD in Management from MIT. So the format today is I'm going to ask Mike to come up and share some comments on uh, how he thinks about energy efficiency. So a company that I think really is a great uh, example in that a core part of their business is, is making the case for energy efficiency to their customers. So this isn't just something that they try to do inside their own company, although that's certainly the case as well, but something that they have to actually go out there and make the case to people with constrained budgets and a lot of skepticism that, th that it makes sense to invest in energy efficient equipment. So a really, I think, interesting perspective uh, of a CEO who's out there every day making this case as a core part of his business. Um, in, in contrast to Peter, that I think brings a global kind of systems perspective um, to view on this and really understanding how energy efficiency fits into the broader sort of orbit of the sustainability challenge. So we see these as really complementary perspectives that hopefully over the course of the next hour or so you get a, a, a kind of a bifocal view that in, sets a, a good foundation for the conversations that will happen when we go to the other room and have the panels. Um, we have a lot to accomplish today, so let's get started. Mike, we really appreciate you being here and uh, look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, Dan. Uh, actually, it's interesting. I do a quarterly call with our uh, global employees around the world. So typically, you can have 60,000 lines open at one time. And last time, or the second time ago we did it, uh, we couldn't find a line we got open because that was in India. The whole time I'm doing this in front of all these folks, uh, there's dogs barking, there's kids screaming, there's a wife yelling at a husband, I don't know who was saying 
it kept happening the whole time. So <laughs> nice part about it, this happened before at home. So that's, that's great. So we got to make sure Peter doesn't do any of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Peter was over my shoulder, but now he's down here. So that's, so that's interesting too. Um, I, I am a graduate of business. It's great to be back. It's great to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, but it's also a little core of the mission of bringing us all in. Back in my days as an MBA student, the conversation was happening around energy efficiency, but I can tell you it wasn't as intense a business issue as it really is today. I'm very pleased to be part of the Climate Core program, the conference, and the energy efficiency is really a business issue. And I want to talk about it this morning as one that's both critical, it's challenging, and it's here to stay. As Climate Core Fellows, your work is vital, and I congratulate all of you and the Environmental Defense Fund on a successful program. Uncovering $90 million in energy and carbon savings is no small feat. And it's all man is very, very proud to be part of this program. In looking out among you, I see a group of dedicated people from around the world dedicated to making a difference in the area of energy efficiency. With worldwide energy consumption project projected to grow 60% in the next 20 years, that's a pretty, pretty daunting task. Already, energy production and consumption creates 94% of carbon dioxide, making energy efficiency critical to reaching our carbon footprint objectives. These are the economics that power the world and directly impact companies like Ingersoll Rand. I'm proud to say that at Ingersoll Rand, we are a world leader in creating and sustaining safe, comfortable, and efficient environments in commercial, residential, and industrial markets. Our products and solutions enhance the quality and comfort of air in homes, in buildings. We transport and protect food and perishables. We secure homes and commercial properties and increase industrial productivity and efficiency. Our commitment to sustainability is at the heart of our mission and as a global diversified industrial firm, Ingersoll Rand is a leader in the energy conservation, and we have a great responsibility in the world to be part of that solution. Energy efficiency is an important issue, as well as a real opportunity for all of us. We have to be responsible, but also realistic and pragmatic in our strategy as we approach the challenges of living in an unprecedented energy and operating environment. The bottom line, is that making an impact on energy efficiency everywhere in the world is a critical priority and it's something each of us can impact. First, I'd like to focus on why energy efficiency is critical. I know everyone in this room is aware of the important role energy efficiency plays in the climate control conversation, but we need to be equally aware of how it's critical to contribute and the great responsibility that we all bear. We have a responsibility to find innovative solutions to address the world's growing energy demands. We have a responsibility to make businesses and industry as energy and operationally efficient as possible. These responsibilities fuel the innovation process, creating new market opportunities to provide products and services that help customers reduce their energy use and greenhouse gas emissions while enhancing their competitiveness. For example, an energy efficient manufacturing location can reduce the amount of downtime, create a better environment for workers, reduce energy reliance, and as a result, even increase through improved competitiveness their capability on the global competitive front. Or a commercial office building can have higher occupancy rates, greater occupant comfort, and fewer complaint calls, while at the same time operate more efficiently, save energy, and reduce its environmental impact. Or take a university like Duke, where energy efficiency is used as an advantage to create a comfortable learning environment that helps improve test scores and increases teacher retention and satisfaction. As you enter the business world, I challenge you to view energy efficiency in a global and economic context. Doing so will make great business leaders out of all of you in today's global environment. As you know, it's not just a U.S. concern, it's a global concern. Let me offer some context about global growth and why it's critical to have a global perspective when you're thinking through energy efficient solutions. The world population is growing and increasingly becoming more urban. And with urbanization comes the challenge of building more homes, schools, and offices. 
Buildings consume 40% of the world's energy. So building expansion plays a significant role as further <coughs> urbanization takes place. Urbanization also brings the need for better infrastructure, systems, and safety, resulting in even higher energy usage. 93% of urban growth will occur in, de occur in developing nations. We expect that in the next decade, the GDP of Brazil, Russia, India, and China will contribute twice as much global growth as the G3. By 2030, India's population is expected to reach nearly 1.5 billion people, with almost 600 million living in urban areas. And that will require $1.2 trillion of investment to provide basic urban infrastructure. In Asia Pacific, China is expected to overtake Japan as the world's number two economy this year, putting China and India in a race to determine who will be next, the next economic powerhouse among emerging markets. By 2025, 350 million people will be added to China's urban population. The implications on energy efficiency in China alone are staggering. And consider that with that growth and urbanization could likely come 50,000 additional skyscrapers, which is the equivalent of 10 New York cities. 700 gigawatts of power plant capacity added. 170 mass transit systems. And 221 cities in China with people uh, populations in excess of 1 million. And as you compare that to Europe as an example, there are only 35 cities in Europe projected to get 1 million people or more. I was in China a couple of months ago to attend our Asia Pacific Leadership Conference and saw the incredible growth firsthand. And as always when I'm there, it reaffirms to me more than ever how we have to prepare ourselves as a company to be part of that growth. Think for a minute about the expansive infrastructure and building requirements to meet these urbanization needs. Companies recognize the urbanization trend and the growth opportunity that comes with it. Ingersoll Rand, as an example, is projecting that more than 40% of our growth will come from emerging markets over the next three years alone. We will invest more in these regions and have the opportunity to help make this growth energy efficient. The reality is that we are in a new global environment with real issues to be addressed and opportunities for building energy efficient and competitive cities, buildings, and businesses. If energy efficiency is not an important equation in all of the construction anticipated in China and India, we will actually lose ground in our environmental efforts. These emerging countries do have a few pragmatic policies that encourage energy efficiency. But we have the opportunity right now to make energy efficient solutions a central part of the urbanization requirement. Our greatest contribution to fighting climate change and creating energy efficiency is innovation, creating new products and services to help customers reduce their energy usage. I lead a global company that has an essential role to play in enhancing the human environment improving the quality of life, promoting energy efficiency and sustainability, and increasing our customers' productivity. To deliver on that role globally as CEO of Ingersoll Rand, I have to manage with a worldwide perspective. I do so with the expectations of customers and shareholders and employees in mind. So I can't have a US-centric point of view about competitiveness, about market opportunity, or around policies, or the impact of energy efficiency. I expect the employees of Ingersoll Rand to have a global perspective just as I do. And I expect our future leaders, leaders like all of you, to recognize that energy efficiency has evolved to a core element of business and operational strategy. We have to embed innovation in our thinking and in everything we do around energy efficiency worldwide. There's a myth I'd like to dispel, and it's a pervasive thought that we need to wait for new technology or need emerging technology to improve energy efficiency. Proven technologies are available right now. Take, for example, all of our existing buildings, and I mentioned that buildings consume 40% of the world's energy, creates huge opportunities for retrofits in homes, offices, and transportation that could lead to 60% cost savings in these areas. Our greatest risk is that we let too much time pass. We need to be aggressive in our efforts to maximize the opportunities that energy efficiency offers us. 
We are still, still in the early stages of this, of this journey. We know energy efficiency is critical, but a better understanding of our roles and responsibilities and recognizing that global urbanization has significant implications on energy efficiency will offer a stronger foundation from which to move forward. I'd like to move now to why I think energy efficiency is challenging. We've established that it's critical. At the same time, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I think it's an easy task. In fact, I would argue that energy efficiency is a challenge to achieve, and let me explain. In the United States, we've moved beyond compliance. We're no longer waiting for government regulators to dictate standards. Like safety initiatives, companies have learned to move from treating energy efficiency as a compliance issue to making it part of their culture and recognizing it as a competitive advantage. Energy efficiency, of course, is still as much a political issue as it is a business issue. It's incumbent on political leaders to create a consensus of policies that pave the way for businesses, government agencies, and non-government organizations to invest the right resources to address energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is identified as the most cost-effective near-term mitigating solution for climate change. So applying appropriate policies and resources enables us, us all to make a difference. But here's the reality. We could experience a competitive disadvantage if global policy does not move forward rapidly and consistently. Lack of parity in policy creates winners and losers in the marketplace due to the high cost of regulatory compliance. At the same time, we all live on the same planet, so we all lose if energy efficiency is not a global priority. The unequal playing field is of particular concern when you consider that a fast-growing country like China is nearly four times less energy efficient than the United States. It's tough to reach a global consensus on policy, and the Kyoto Protocol was a start, but it places developed and developing countries on an unequal playing field. Inconsistent global policies disadvantage leading companies who want to do the right thing, which in turn affects jobs, and it ultimately rewards companies who have not invested as strongly in energy efficient operations and customer solutions. Let me give you an example between China and the, and the US. My concern here is that an aggressive greenhouse cap and trade policy or carbon tax in the US will actually increase the cost structure of products produced and services here in the US without doing the same in China. Ingersoll Rand is in the business of manufacturing products. We have to make difficult decisions to choose where we produce those products. And if we have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders to make those decisions based on where we can achieve the greatest return for those shareholders. An aggressive uh, cap and trade policy in the U.S. could provide incentives for manufacturers to move plants to countries like India or China, and in doing so, manufacturers actually cut their emissions here to zero. They don't have the plant. Putting them in compliance with the U.S or the increase in emissions from newly open plant China or India. India. The net result is negative. Fewer jobs in the U.S. and greater emissions contributing to global warming. <clears throat> global businesses are going to invest in geographies with favorable trade, tax, and environmental policies. Ingersoll Rand's heavy investment in U.S. employment and jobs is directly tied to these comparative national policy balances. Some CEOs have actually even expressed an unwillingness to continue growing their business in the United States until we change our policies. And that is a huge problem. Now, there's some positive global policy developments that we can and, frankly, must build on. The Chinese government is driving energy efficiency in order to preserve its capital for investment and in benefits other than energy plant growth. In addition, this focus on energy efficiency increases the government's credibility on the global political stage, which is becoming more and more important to a growing world leader. This approach is being built into Beijing's objectives and is being pushed down through the provinces and the major cities. India lags China's progress, but it has approved creation of a national mission for enhanced energy efficiency, which is taking a similar pragmatic but not necessarily environmental approach. These examples are practical steps in the right direction. However, they're still very incremental and not what is being implemented in the developed countries. As you enter the business world, I hope you'll become part of the process. Policy advocacy plays a strong role. It will be soon your uh, opportunity to make a difference. 
And I challenge you to, to, to commit, uh, through which you're ready to demonstrate as being part of climate court, to continue to be actively engaged in the environmental policy debate. It's challenging. We need to do it because energy efficiency is here to stay. And if we don't do something about it, there will be severe consequences down the road for all people and for the world. Let's talk now about why I think energy efficiency is here to stay. It's not a flash in the pan. Because of the economic and environment, environmental impact, it's a mega trend, a mega trend that requires public and private sectors to work together. An interconnectivity model is the only way to address this challenge. And by this, I mean policymakers must put forth the right policies and incentives to implement energy, energy conservation measures at the right times so they're complementary to infrastructure and economic development. Financial services companies must offer the cash to make the upgrades and enhancements that are considered. And non-governmental organizations and universities must advocate for responsible, sustainable business practices and initiatives. To successfully apply the model requires three courses of action. First, we need to remove obstacles and ensure greater accountability to great energy efficient infrastructure. Second, we offer, need to offer the financing to do it. And third, we need to create consumer activism through purchasing power to do the right thing. Successfully applying interconnectivity to emerging nations means one important mandate. We need to do it right the first time, rather than creating inefficient infrastructure from the start. For both developed and developing nations, partnerships at all levels are necessary to bring the best minds together to create sustainable infrastructure. This interconnectivity concept and all the players involved demonstrates the magnitude of energy efficiency and the reason it is and it will remain a megatrend. More than ever, energy efficiency is becoming a fundamental element of business strategy, both at Ingersoll Rand and across thousands of companies worldwide. The reason? Expectations have changed. Customer expectations have changed. They want more than just cost and service. The biggest impact we can have on our energy efficiency is what we can do for our customers. We need to figure out how to make energy efficient products and solutions without causing an economic penalty to the consumer. Investor expectations have also changed. We're evaluating how we innovate and implement energy efficiency strategies to produce stronger financials. In my expectations, as CEO have changed, we must innovate, collaborate, and demonstrate results. At Ingersoll Rand, we're a member of the Save Energy Now leaders through the US Department of Energy. We've refined our energy management strategy with the goal of reducing global energy intensity 25% by 2019. We will reach this goal by directly inserting ourselves into this interconnectivity model, developing alliances and partnerships, getting more on top of research, and using external relationships, just like this one, to improve innovation. It's why we established the Center for Energy Efficiency and Sustainability at Ingersoll Rand about six months ago. The center works with outside partners like Envi Environmental Defense Fund with the Climate Corps program to shape the vision and break new ground in energy efficiency. The center helps us to create marketable, innovative opportunities that drive energy efficiency globally. The center is a living example in our company of the triple bottom line, the merging of economic and social performance. It's a way to incorporate the triple bottom line into the way we actually run our business. My job is to inspire and to drive commitment within Ingersoll Rand to fulfill our mission of sustainability. And if necessary, my job is to remove obstacles to facilitate change. Because the need for energy efficiency is here to stay, it's imperative that we integrate it throughout the whole company at all times. That's why I welcome groups like Climate Corps to improve our audit processes and, and find even more efficiencies. At Ingersoll Rand, we were fortunate enough to have Akshay Hanati and Kurt Pruden join us this summer. Akshay and Kurt were involved in a number of projects and I'd like to highlight their energy work that they did for us. They conducted five energy audits in the eastern half of the country on our behalf. These energy audits identified annual cost savings of $1.2 million, with an annual energy savings of 5.8 million kilowatt hours and a reduction of more than 4,000 tons of CO2. Their work in creating a business case to perform baseline energy monitoring potentially will result in more than $9 million in savings to our company. It is a project that will pay for itself in a year. These recommendations on future projects and strategic initiatives that these two, uh, two students provided will help Ingersoll Rand move ahead with our sustainability efforts. 
If we heed these understandings and implications, we realize that tangible results directly associated with the competitive advantage that energy efficiency can offer us is out there for us to, uh, to achieve. In conclusion, I stress three things. First, energy efficiency is critical. It's the right thing to do. At the end of the day, we all live on the same planet. Second, energy efficiency is challenging. We need the right policies that can level the playing field. And third, energy efficiency is here to stay. We have no option but to accept and welcome the job of making it a top priority. It's a big job and one that requires the work of businesses, government, NGOs, and all of you working together to create uh, what, what hopefully will be a great tomorrow. I challenge you, the Climate Corps Fellows, to take further action to make energy efficiency a priority, to become more engaged in the political process, and to continue to make recommendations that result in direct energy savings as you enter the next phase of your lives and in your careers. I hope I leave you today with a broader perspective for this critical issue and the importance it has on our personal and business success. I encourage the Environmental Defense Fund to grow the Climate Corps program so it can challenge companies like Ingersoll Rand to be our best and continue to make recommendations that are meaningful to our customers, meaningful to our bottom line, and most of all, meaningful to our society. So again, thanks for inviting me, and I'll turn it over now to Dan, uh, and uh, hopefully the technology will work, right? Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Mike, you want to come over here? All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. That was great. I think um, a few themes that are really worth keeping in mind um, as we go through the day. I really resonated with your global framing of the issue, that we can't think of this in narrow parochial terms. Um, either at the level of the way that corporations make decisions and investments, as well as at the, cause the sort of the connect, uh, connections and interrelationships at the level of policy. So I think that, that was really powerful. I think this uh, idea of challenge we all um, see and experience, and I think you did a great job of kind of queuing up what some of those challenges are. Um, I'd like to just say also that um, the, the folks that we have here in the room uh, include the Climate Corps Fellows and the, the corporate sponsors of those fellows. And I think it, it was by design that we really wanted to have the community of people who had participated in the Climate Corps program together here to uh, engage in this. The, the company representatives are the ones that are there for the long haul that can take these, uh, these opportunities and help to really um, steward them through the organizations and change the culture over the long term around these issues. So we see it as really uh, critical that we have that kind of mix in the room and really pleased with the kind of um, uh, representation we have from both sides on that. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Peter. I already have given you sort of uh, Peter's um, bi uh, biographical background and really excited to hear his point of view on this that I think will uh, resonate and connect with some of the things that Mike said, but I think will take us in some new directions as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Peter. Um, and then uh, when Peter finishes, all of you will have a chance to engage. We'll have some um, question and answer that I'll, I'll lead, and then we'll turn it over to you. So stay tuned for that. Be taking notes, you know, queue up those questions. We'll be able to engage them later on in the day. But with that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> as usually is the case with a, a technological problem, there's always a human problem as well. And when the fellows down there tried to reconnect, I didn't actually know how to answer the phone. <laughs> I answered it correctly. That's one you could see. I could hear you, but you couldn't see me uh, a little while ago. So uh, first off, uh, let me say I'm really pleased to join you. Um, and I think what Dan had in mind today uh, makes a lot of sense to kind of look at this from within the growing energy efficiency industry and business opportunity, as Mike's been sharing, and also to look at it from outside, which I think is kind of my role in this process. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm hoping that, um, after I make a few brief comments now, you will know, have a pretty interesting exchange, because I do think there are two very, very different and ultimately complementary points of view. And my main point is we need to hold both of us. Um, and the simplest way for me to express what that means is around the question, is energy efficiency the end game or is it the beginning game? Uh, 
There's two or three reasons why I think it's pretty clear that energy efficiency could not be end game. There's a lot of reasons, many of which Mike already touched on, why it's a, why it's a critical game right now in the developing world, like for us, and in the developing world both. Um, but I think I'd like to start with that first point. Um, why is it not the end game? There's two or three reasons why we shouldn't put too much stock in energy efficiency to solve the immense problems we have. And there's kind of two basic groups of these problems. One is we have tremendous energy demand in the world. Uh, with population growth and industrialization, I mean, no one knows how much this energy demand will grow. There's kind of standard estimates out there, like shared some of them. Um, the other, of course, is the side effects of our present energy system, the primary of which is uh, climate change. But it's only one. There's water use, there's particulate emissions, um, there's a, a very big counter coal movement in China for, for many years now. And it's not because of climate change. It's because no one wants to fire power plants in their backyard, even the Chinese. Um, so the idea that uh, we're going to get any place long term with energy efficiency, I think, is naive and ultimately counterproductive. And I, I want to underline what I said a minute ago. I want to share my basic point. I want to share there's two points of view here, and they're important complements to one another. We'll spend a little time kind of developing the second point of view. If I were in Mike's shoes, I would have advocated that I would have strongly emphasized the first point of view. We need to really get going in energy efficiency. I couldn't agree more. On the other hand, get going quick. Without a clear idea of the energy system that we want to have in two, three, four, five decades, I actually think energy efficiency is a very slippery slope, or if you will, a double-edged sword. Peter, can I intervene just just a moment? Yeah. If you could um, hold the mic a little bit closer, we're having a little bit of um, sound issues. If you could speak a little bit louder and closer to the mic. I have no mic. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe just uh, project that voice across the distance. Hey, Peter, uh, there should be a microphone a on the table, I think, in front of. No, there's no mic on the table. The mic is embedded in the, uh, in the camera here. Lesson uh, number one. <laughs> So I'll do my best just to speak loudly. I, I assume there's a little bit of control at your end to turn up the game. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me just speak more loudly. And do just chime in again. Dan, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why I think energy efficiency is important, but it's not the end game. The first is that, as in any area where there's a lot of waste, I mean, the US wastes a tremendous amount of energy. China wastes more energy. So Mike is absolutely right to emphasize the Chinese opportunity for energy efficiency as well as the US. But a corollary to that is there's huge rooms for improvement. Great. On the other hand, uh, yesterday we heard one statistic in the EDF meeting up here. I think uh, Dan shared a, a similar one. If we really got our act together on energy efficiency, we could reduce the uh, uh, carbon emissions by 20% by 2020 in the US probably you could achieve even greater reductions in China, given the greater relative amount of energy waste. However, the Chinese economy grows at about 10% per year. That means it doubles in size every seven years. So you can do the math for yourself. It's a simple multiplication. You achieve a 50% improvement in energy efficiency is wiped out in one seven-year doubling time in the Chinese economy. So at one level, energy efficiency is a no-brainer. There's absolutely no compelling argument against it. On the other hand, if that just goes back into energy efficiency will reduce costs, it will improve profits, it will give you more capital to invest in more growth. What business doesn't see that as the basic logic? So it really brings us to a much deeper question. What are the goals for our economies? What are the goals for our companies in terms of their total absolute footprint? Just remember, nature does not care how efficient we are. 
Nature cares how much coal we have to extract from the earth, how much CO2 and other particulates we generate in the atmosphere. It's the absolutes that matter. That's why it's always important to do the multiplication. This is not complicated. You have energy or you double energy efficiency, you double the size of your economy. It's a net zero impact on use of energy and, depending on the fuel mix, on carbon emissions. In the U.S., that will happen more slowly. So if we get a 20% improvement in energy efficiency in the U.S. in terms of the impact that could have on carbon emissions, which is a typical thing, we heard it yesterday in EDF meeting in Boston, if we really are active in the U.S., we can improve, we can reduce carbon emissions 20% through energy efficiency investment. But even at a modest growth rate, a 3% growth rate, in that same 20 years, the U.S. economy grows 40%. And there you wipe out your 20% improvement in energy efficiency. So we just have to look at the larger system here. If we just focus on energy efficiency by itself, we can feel really good. And we should feel really good. But if we don't look at the larger system, if we don't do the multiplication, the total scale of the economy, the total absolute value of energy consumed, multiplied by the efficiency with which we produce that energy consumed, well, we see pretty quickly that energy efficiency will never overcome continuing growth in energy demand. And depending upon the fuel mix, you'll pretty quickly lose any advantage you gain on carbon. Obviously, that latter point, depending on the fuel mix, is, is really critical. And by the way, I'm not even commenting on the other real reason why you can't put too much stock in energy efficiency. It's a basic low-hanging fruit argument that we all know in most areas where there's a lot of ways to get a lot of improvement in the short term, and if subsequent improvements get harder and harder to achieve. Now, in fact, in most settings, it, it's more kind of a series of plateaus rather than a steadily diminishing curve. Uh, but sooner or later, the, the, the additional improvements in energy efficiency get a little harder to realize. Uh, we saw this big time in, in the quality management movement in the U.S. and all these improvements in quality management in the first five years, ten years, U.S. auto industry actually was becoming reasonably competitive with Japanese. Uh, but then it got to a point where the low-hanging fruit had been picked, and the high-hanging fruit required management change, which is something the U.S. auto industry was never quite able to do. Uh, and consequently, pretty soon, started to lose its relative advantage because the low-hanging fruit were no longer around. So there's that argument as well, but I actually consider that a secondary point to the first one, the multiplication point. It's the absolute amount of energy used, it's the absolute amount of coal that's burned, it's the absolute amount of CO2 that's generated, it's the absolute amount of particulates, and so on, the side effects of the fossil fuel energy that's the most important, because it does bring us to the other big point. Um, so in this other point of view, my argument would be that we're really losing the opportunity, the energy efficiency persistence, if we cannot answer one question. And the question is, what is the energy system we're trying to move towards? We are moving towards an energy system will more and more depend upon coal. That is exactly what's happening around the world, is what's happening in the United States, is what will happen in China. You know, the percentage of energy generated by coal could very easily go to 50 to 60 percent in the world. Coal and natural gas are the rising sources of energy. Oil is obviously peak and coming down. Is that the energy system we want? Just imagine this scenario. That's the energy system we're headed towards. What does energy efficiency do in that system? It makes it easier to stay on the coal path. That's why I use the metaphor of a slippery slope or a double-edged sword. Energy efficiency by itself will make it easier to stay on the path where we do not have to change to alternative fuel mix. On the other hand, it doesn't have to. On the other hand, if we have a compelling vision of where we want to go, to me, the single question that's not asked, and it's the single most important question, nothing else even comes close in this whole domain, if we really step back and look at the whole system, is what's the energy system we want to have? 
how does nature produce energy? How do other living systems get the energy they need? We're the only species on the planet, as far as any of us can know, that digs holes in the ground to take up and bring from deep under the earth stuff that used to be alive and burn. We think we're very sophisticated, but notice we just burn stuff to get our energy. Uh, no other species does that. In almost every other instance where you can look at energy production and consumption in the living world, it's global. The points of production and use are close in space, relatively close in time. We're the only ones who depend on a massive centralized system of energy production. And I should point out, with that centralized system of energy production comes an enormous centralization of economic power and political power. And if we talk about challenges, that's the first one we're going to have to talk about. Nature has a decentralized system of energy production. The cell captures and uses energy in the same spot. So with that kind of image, how does the rest of the species on the Earth get their energy? Um, we then start to paint a very different picture. It's kind of a mosaic. Uh, the energy system in the future will probably not be a homogenous system. I can't see how it's a centralized system, since no other species on Earth depends on centralized energy. And ultimately, we have to live by the same rules as everybody else. But all I'm saying, really, is that this is a question that should be at the center of all these conversations. Because only if we can answer the question in Western China, in Eastern China, in Northern India, in Southern India, in the West of the United States, in the East of the United States, this is going to be a more regionalized system. What's in our vision of the energy system in the future? Now, I guarantee you, once we get serious about that, getting from here to there will be energy efficiency will be absolutely critical. It buys us time. We desperately need time. But time to go where? Secondly, it can teach us about energy. I mean, the first impediment most businesses encounter is they actually know so little about energy. The reason they know so little is it costs so little. Businesses have never got, had to get serious about where does their energy come from, but most importantly, how do they use it? Where do they waste it? How do you get a bunch of really, really smart people, like managed American companies, to waste, arguably, sometimes people say 50% of their energy? The system as a whole probably wastes more than 50%. How does that happen? Except there's almost no incentive to do otherwise. And I, I thought it was great that Dan started off by talking about Jimmy Carter. I mean, he's an icon of the movement. He's an icon of the movement that's been around for a long time. And the arguments in favor of energy efficiency have been here for a long time. But he's an icon of the fact that, look, we haven't yet gotten off our rears to do something. And the simple answer to that is, it's just simply not important enough to us to do it. That's how you get a bunch of smart people who don't collectively improve energy efficiency. The most obvious reason for that is the pricing of energy. It's an immense problem in the U.S. It's an immense problem in China. Uh, Mike's absolutely right. The Central Party, Communist Party, is very clear about energy efficiency. Energy efficiency <coughs> targets have been in the state-owned enterprise balanced scorecards in China for the last three to four years. Almost none of them get met. So it's not a lack of understanding in Beijing. Believe me, there's a major energy or climate change conference every week in Beijing. People understand the issues. They're totally paralyzed. One of the reasons they're paralyzed is the centralized edicts don't get implemented in the provinces. They get ignored by a lot of state-owned enterprises. And one of the main reasons is the same problem we have. The price of energy is actually set by a different agency that is trying to set these energy efficiency targets. The NDRC is responsible for energy prices. They're actually on a totally different page than the people trying to push, push energy efficiency in, in China. So I just use this to illustrate. We've all got more or less the same problems. You know, we speak out of both sides of our mouth. We say energy efficiency is important, but we all want cheap energy prices. Come on. This is not a picture of that side. You turn that around and you ask, how the heck are we ever going to get to a regime where energy pricing starts to make some sense? Mike pointed out a very important dilemma. One country takes the lead on a cap and trade system, the net effect of which is to push energy prices up. That's its intent. That's its purpose. Push the price of energy generated by fossil fuels higher. They encourage substitution to encourage energy efficiency. 
Lithium ion energy was generated from coal, natural gas, and oil to encourage the acceleration of the transition to alternative energy. But if only the US does it, China does it, that's a huge dilemma. It creates an enormous disadvantage for the US economy. So this is one of those examples. I mean, I was thinking, listening to Mike, this is a big game of chicken. You got the Americans and the Chinese kind of covering each other, looking at who's going to dodge first. Uh, I don't think the answer to that question is going to be do nothing. <coughs> I think the answer to that question is going to be to say the Chinese have the exact same ultimate set of incentives that we believe in. They've got an even bigger time. They have enormous dilemmas between growing demands for growth and energy and enormous environmental problems. If you want to expand the system a little bit further, all you have to talk about is water. It doesn't come up in any conversations about energy efficiency, but believe me, it's, it's, it's quickly approaching as the number one issue in China and India. So how do we have an energy system that actually also conserves water? Is not something you're going to get to by just looking at energy efficiency, although you could. You can use energy efficiency to teach us all about the total set of key interconnections that are critical for meeting our energy needs. And in the context of a picture of where we want to go, that could be an incredibly important learning process. So, my hope is, I'm trying to make a rather complicated argument. I want to, uh, like Mike, you just summarize, did just summarize it briefly so it doesn't sound confusing. I am not in any way arguing against energy efficiency. I'm just saying we've got to take this plant and put it in a different pot. The pot is not how we just keep growing our economies. How do we make businesses more profitable? How do we make our countries capable of just continuing on the path of GDP growth? Look, imagine a perfect energy system tomorrow. Perfect. Everybody can just keep growing as you <coughs> the, w, the World Health Organization estimates that China and India will be unable to meet half of their water needs by 2030. Half. Sooner or later, these deep issues have to be addressed. Energy is a lever. And within that lever, by talking about what's the energy system we want, energy efficiency is a critical lever for the lever. If we use it well, and that's my last question, what will it take to use it well? Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Peter. I think that's a really um, useful frame of reference for us to take into the day of the discussion of energy efficiency, is understanding this as one really critical but insufficient variable in the broader sustainability equation. Um, so I think that doesn't diminish the importance of a focus on capturing the energy efficiency opportunity, but it does suggest that we really have to keep a view of the total system uh, across, uh, across the entire globe, across all the different parts of the economy, and across all the different parts of the biosphere. So I think it's a really useful and um, constructive way of sort of framing the day. Um, I, I really am pleased with the kind of dynamic that we've created between Mike and Peter, both sort of illuminating, I think, a really relevant and important piece of the, the dynamic. And we want to continue this conversation. Before we do, I just want to give you know, one point of reference to sort of echo some of this. I just came from the World Energy Congress in Montreal earlier this week. And one of the things I, I was really shocked by, Peter talked about the increasing reliance on coal. And what I heard in that conference was a much stronger sort of uh, um, call to action by the advocates for coal as the key lever for eliminating energy poverty. So I think we've been used to over the last number of years that there's sort of the good guys and the bad guys, and it was pretty easy to sort of position that. I think as we begin to frame these debates with objectives that really point in very different directions of, you know, one out of four people in the world who've never touched an on switch and eliminating that, that's a, that's a cause you can really get your heart behind and mobilize around. And yet, I think these broader issues of how to do that in a way that doesn't ultimately destroy the, 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 the biosphere and the sort of the fundamental resources we rely on, I think being able to kind of pull these agendas apart, understand where there are tensions between those objectives and really try to navigate a very complex path 
Um, you know, that's going to define all of the course of the career that all of us are here um, fighting for. So um, I'm thrilled that we're able to sort of get off on a good start with this. And let me just um, move to the kind of conversation piece. I'll ask a few questions, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Let me give you just one bit of logistical um, uh, advice. The way we'll need to do this is if you can raise your hand um, to ask a question. And then when I call on you, you need to push on the little button um, that's on your mics. There's one between each of the two seats. There's a little button at the bottom that you push, and you need to push and hold on that button and see the green light. If the green light's on, you're not being heard by Peter, and we want to have Peter be able to hear all of the conversation as well. So when we go to that, I'll turn it over to you. I'll look for hands and call on people, and then push and hold on the button while you ask your question. That'll also orient the camera for Peter to you. Um, so a little bit of logistics on that. Um, let me ask the first question, and then I'll um, join Mike over in the in the chairs. Uh, it's really interesting when you hear energy efficiency, you hear at least three different kinds of stories. One is, ah, oh, it's a no-brainer, right? This is the kind of uh, investment that doesn't require any uh, intervention by policy. It pays for itself. The technology is ready. It's there. It's money in the floor. You know, $100 bills, $1,000 bills, million-dollar bills laying on the floor. It's a no-brainer. Second sort of story you hear is, we are poised for capturing the energy efficiency opportunity. If only, if only there were policy changes that made it uh, you know, uh, in our interest to really capture those. So we're ready to go, but we just can't make the case unless there's some policy intervention. Um, and the final one is, uh, and I heard this in a conversation with a utility CEO recently, he said, look, I work with companies every day, they're CEOs, they've been at this 20 years, they've captured it all. I mean, there's maybe little bits and pieces around, but for the most part, they're as efficient as they're going to get. If you think you're going to go in and tell them how to capture energy efficiency uh, savings, you're nuts. They've already done it. So those are really different stories. No-brainer, if only, and been there, done that. So I'd like to open the conversation with Peter and Mike and say, which of those resonate with you, and how would you make sense of three really different stories? Let me turn it over to Peter and then ask Mike to comment as well. Well, I hear a lot of the uh, if only. Uh, you know, I hear from the, you know, I guess as I listen to your three questions, I, I hear three voices. The advocates of energy efficiency, uh, and there's a lot of great ones out there, um, will, are the no-brainer uh, advocates. Uh, they're basically saying, look, you know, there's money on the table here. It'd be crazy to walk away and leave it there. Um, but my response to that is, typically it's not enough money to really get a lot of people's attention. Now, Relatively good companies usually are pretty good at this, although Dan gave an interesting statistic at the outset saying more so in Europe than here. Um, so I, I think that, uh, and definitely more so than in China. And I think that turns right back to the vice. You know, you say, well, there's money on the table, why don't you take it? If there was a dime on the table, a lot of us would not make a big deal out of it. Now, some would. <laughs> if there's 50 bucks on the table, it's very different. So obviously, it's really the amount of money on the table that's really, that really tends to get a larger scale change to occur. Um, the if only I hear um, all the time, particularly from people who are saying, gee, we can't understand you know, why things aren't moving quicker, um, but we must need help from somebody else. You know, like, well, Washington has to get their act together. I don't know about you all, but you know we're all going to be old and gray by the time that happens. <laughs> so I think the short answer to that is, you know, if only is if forever. Uh, and last one, we've been there and done that. Uh, I think that um, that's true for some cases. I mean, we should expect that, and it's a different fruit. In that metaphor of the low-hanging fruit, I think in the manufacturing sector in the U.S., there are some pockets of a lot of intelligence. Uh, in terms of how energy is used, where it's used, how it's wasted. Uh, you have a lot of good examples, but they're a relatively small number. And it doesn't filter out more broadly. So all those are legitimate points of view but from different people. But none of them get the big picture. I mean, you have to put them all together, and then you have to add, put the one that's not there, which is what I was saying before, which is, why does this matter for my kids? It's not just an economic argument. It's a question of, what is, how, why is energy important? Look, at, here is the unintended side effect of underpricing energy. It's really simple. 
And underpricing, I, I realize that might sound like a controversial term. Certainly if I said it in Washington, it would be very controversial. But look, it's another way to say externalities, right? If you believe that there really are significant externalities around our energy uh, system, then the number to say that is it's vast, it's underpriced. And you could argue vastly underpriced. Um, why does that matter? Well, it only matters. Since the price is too low, the side effect of that is that it's not a salient issue for most people. There's a lot of studies done of homeowners. And why don't people do a better job of insulation and smart metering and better windows? And the answer is, it's just not a big deal to them. We have to figure out a way to make it a big deal. The only way it's a big deal is that what we do today is important for getting where we want to be with our kids. So that comes back to the point I was trying to make before. That's the, 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 the story you don't hear nearly enough. Why is it not a big deal for us? And what would it take to make it a big deal? Thanks, Peter. Uh, Mike, you are every day talking to people who are responding to your argument for energy efficiency. Which of those um, sound like the kind of voices you hear? Uh, very interesting. Over the last uh, 18, uh, 20 months through the recession, the fastest uh, part of our business in terms of growth uh, was performance contract. We were up about 40%. And that's the business where we'll go in and do mechanical and operational retrofits to buildings and have the savings uh, from that retrofit, you know, pay uh, capital. So it's, it's just really a lease, uh, you know, five years, seven years sort of a payback. It's very, very interesting because it, became, it came to the forefront um, as people, uh, customers were looking for solutions to reduce operating uh, operating costs. Interesting now that the economy has picked up a little bit and you've got constrained working capital, you've got credit lines that are cut, you've got uncertainty with companies as to you know, how they want to play sort of the growth uh, in the future and, and, and even uh, to what extent they're going to invest in jobs or in, in new capital, um, it slowed down a little bit. So what happens, and you know, to Peter's point, it, it becomes less of a priority relative to that company's core business. And so you can see a slowdown uh, you know, sort of inversely related to the recession. And I, I think that, so no brainer in the recession, business was booming. Now that you've got competing uh, sources, uh, you know, competing uh, business cases for investment uh, in your core business, uh, which might be producing a product or uh, servicing customers in a line of business, or investing in energy efficiency, it's slowed down. And I think that that's where there's a tipping point here, which, which could be uh, you know, agitated uh, positively a bit, uh, I think, through the right kinds of incentives uh, to, uh, to get after this. I think Peter's right in the long run and around understanding the system itself and where we want to go. In, in the short run, you know, I, I think that there's a real opportunity to do the right thing, which is to you know, draw it down, become more efficient, put more pressure on ourselves as innovators of product and services to create these uh, technology uh, opportunities to improve efficiency. Excellent. Uh, Peter, I, I have another question for you. It's clear that um, the way that you frame this issue requires a really pretty deep discussion and understanding of a very complex system on one hand with lots of stakeholders internationally on the other. Where do you see the kind of uh, roots of uh, those kind of conversations happening um, in the world? Do you see some positive sort of places where that kind of conversation is happening, where you believe that there might be a seed that could grow and you know build momentum over time and um, you know I think for this group we really need to find our allies out there and they're pretty dispersed so do you have a point of view on where some of those um, you know sort of uh, points of light might be? Well, it's a great question. Um, I think it's a really good question for Mike as well since he obviously is trying to really help the company look at this as a global uh, phenomenon and understand the realities in different settings. As I said, I, I believe China is, is a little linchpin. Um, I think, you know, a, a pivot is I think wither China, wither the world. Um, India and China obviously both. Um, and I, I see really interesting um, period of turbulence in China right now. There's got a lot of ferment below the surface. As I said, the party has been, the Central Committee, has been pushing energy efficiency now for five years, four or five years. Um, with very little real success. We tend to think that in China the people did not rule the roost, but it's a much more distributed power system than we realize. And in those provincial party uh, chieftains is a lot of power. 
Um, and you know, they build coal-fired power plants, and they got a great rent-generating system from building those coal-fired power plants. Once, one a week, on average, in the last two or three years. Um, on the other hand, I think China is starting to see the opportunity for them as a country to lead the energy revolution. Uh, every time I'm there, I hear fascinating stories. I mean, their plans for wind in the west of China are massive. Um, I keep hearing stories about batteries, thin film photovoltaics. Um, I think they've got all the right elements to really be the leader in the energy revolution. They have tremendous demand internally. They have plenty of ability to come down the cost curves, probably faster than anybody. They've got all the engineering and scientific sophistication you need. If you look at where they've been investing for a long time, it's to lead in different sectors, not to follow the cheap labor. Um, and gradually, I think the stars will align politically. So I think China is really quite key because of its ability to kind of drive an agenda centrally, which the Indians don't really have. Um, I think they are starting to see the opportunity for them to be the world leaders. They'll be selling the batteries, the thin film photovoltaics in the world. And I think that will help pull them forward, which is what they need, just like all of us. In that scenario, where do you put the US? I think, you know, one of the things that could open up minds of a lot of people in this country is, you know, do we really want to be buying those batteries and thin film photovoltaics from Chinese? You know, do we really want to lose whatever space we have? And I think it's still significant to be an innovation leader. Uh, that might really help open up the political paralysis we have in this country right now. You see that more right now in the world. You see it in the states, you see it in the cities, you see all kinds of fascinating partnerships going on between Chinese cities and US cities because of the paralysis in Washington. So uh, I think China is really quite pivotal. And it's a very complicated picture. And I, I oversimplify it a lot in what I just said. But that's that's one of the places I, I try to pay a lot of attention. Great. I'd like to um, shift gears a little bit and turn to um, Mike. We're going to, uh, over the course of the day, kind of walk through the energy efficiency process. So what, what's the reason that companies pursue these opportunities in the first place? How do they identify them? How do they finance them? How do they execute against them? You know, over that kind of life cycle, obviously companies are getting stuck because they're not capturing these opportunities at the rate that at least a lot of people would suggest they potentially could. Where do you see the points where, sort of systematically, as companies move through that process, they get stuck? Is it at the financing level? Is it at the motivation level? Is it at the technical ability to see kind of where those opportunities are? Where do you see this um, sort of sticking points for companies? I'd actually build on uh, Peter's point in China to answer that question. You know, if you go to a uh, uh, Beijing, down through a provincial governor, down through a mayor, uh, it's typically the third or fourth priority on a mayor's goal sheet objectives are going to be around the environment. Uh, if you go to a company, it's typically going to be down the prioritization scale relative to what they believe it for business to be. And so what it really takes is having uh, the advocacy inside the company to make it important. It, it really takes the passion of individuals inside the company who believe it's important to do. Um, and as a company begins to uh, build and communicate and organize around sustainability issues <coughs> inside a company, you tend to generate a lot of that advocacy inside the company to make it important. Frankly, too, uh, uh, just about anybody we hired, I would say the last uh, five years under the age of 30, um, has come into the company, and, and one, of the, one of the top questions they'll ask us is talk to us a little bit about sustainability and your view of the environment, and, and, they're, and they're looking for cues and clues about do you really put uh, your, your words and actions uh, together in a coherent way. And, and I think that what you see is that building advocacy, that building uh, inside a company to, to, to increase the prioritization, to find the opportunities to go forward. But again, it's competing with the prioritization uh, inside a company. I think it's harder for a company in a growth environment to prioritize it. Uh, it was evident to us, even in terms of our own business and the business we provide to other customers, how we saw our business take off when there weren't those other growth competing priorities when it became part of the cost equation. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that the, the, the advocacy and, and, and the passion and commitment, uh, companies either organizing around that or, 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 or more of, I would say, a, a, a groundswell in, in the thinking around sustainability emerging more into uh, the mainstream. You, you know, most companies today are putting together sustainability reports and have got active uh, sort of governance at the board level around sustainability, so it's getting more attention at that level. 
I it's just going to take some time. Mm -hmm. Peter, what about you? You have a lot of contact with leaders in business and government and education and healthcare. Um, where do you see the, the sort of the advocacy for this agenda coming from and where do you see the sticking points? Uh, well, I certainly agree with what Mike just said. Uh, if you, any fundamental change moves forward if there are people who are really passionate about it. it, it that, that's a first principle. Uh, and I think one of the things that's very interesting about all the sustainability issues is we, we tend to think the advocacy has to be at the top. But we've seen often quite a few common examples. Now, sooner or later, the leadership that comes from the people in positions like Mike's will matter. But I've seen plenty of counterexamples where someone like Mike is pushing on strength. I mean, you, you think, well, the CEO gave the speech. Lots going to change now. <laughs> but it's just a speech, you know? If you look at the, at the pressures operating at the day-to-day -day operating level, and you look at the leadership of the local line leaders, you look at the divisional leaders, you look at the people in between that speech and what determines the actual practices and processes, there are big, big gaps. And, and conversely, I think we've seen some fascinating leadership kind of emerge from networks of people in the front lines. And the two have to come together. This is not either or in any stretch. But I think it's, I mean, I heard yesterday someone say it in a very, <laughs> very poignant way. He said, I'm so sick and tired of the CEO speeches. I've heard so many of them. I'm sure Mike has heard a lot of them. You know, you can just feel like it's like there's a, a script writing, speech writing machine behind the scenes, and it's all cranking out the same stuff, and it just pours out. I mean, it's always what you do. You made this point earlier. You know, this is like the first rule of hierarchical leadership. You know, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And it's not what you do alone. It's the signals that people perceive at their level in the enterprise. So if there aren't targets, if there aren't good measurement systems, if there aren't good assessment systems, if it doesn't get built into the performance review process, all the things that make it real to people in the enterprise, they'll say, hey, good speech, <coughs> and go back to business as usual. Yeah, yeah and uh, just, to, um, just to push a little bit on this, I, Peter, you talked earlier on about the um, need to get clear about what is the energy system that we want, and I guess by extension, what's the economy want, we want, What's the society that we ultimately want? So all these, uh, in some ways, are enablers toward some kind of ultimate goal. Um, and there's something, there are sacred cows here, right? Um, uh, economic growth has been a sacred um, cow. Um, consumption, you know, those are issues that are not very popular to talk about, and it's hard to put sort of in the frame of a business in a meaningful way. But I guess to sort of throw some skepticism um, into that, uh, how do we think about uh, what kind of energy system, what kind of economy do we want in 2050 that could begin to calibrate some of these discussions and position things like energy efficiency and sustainability efforts in, in the context of a broader effort that can achieve some of these aims that at some level we all agree to, and yet it doesn't seem like these things are adding up to a trajectory that get us there. So uh, maybe I can turn it over to you, Mike. I know this is a, a, a challenging question for a CEO who on one hand is, got the fiduciary responsibility to deliver on that growth expectation to investors and other stakeholders, and yet by the same token, being part of a broader context that um, we all share some of those fundamental goals, whether it's as human beings and parents or as leaders of business to, to have a vision for where we're heading. What's your sense of kind of, uh, you know, what the, what the world looks like in 2050 and the kind of business that you're in? Certainly efficiency is an enabler to that. Can you enrich sort of the picture of that of that for us. Yeah, I, I wish I knew what the world would look like in 2030 yeah. or else we would be trying to drive you know, our strategies uh, at that point in time. You know, our planning as a company goes out to say five years uh, max and we try to you know build a business portfolio that looks out 20 years over the trends that we see you know happening in the economy. You know for us energy efficiency urbanization, uh, food safety preservation and transport you know, these, uh, security as, as as you see more affluence and more uh, urbanization are, are key businesses for us. That, that's the CEO talking there about sort of what businesses you're you're in. You know, it, 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 it's, it's just a, an individual talking about sort of uh, what makes sense, what's got us to this point, uh, you know, relative success uh, in this country and in others. It's been around productivity and innovation, and I think that it is driving both of those things full speed. Uh, and, and you know, by productivity, I mean you know finding 
you know, more efficient means, you know, better ways of doing whatever it is that we do, not just energy efficiency, but productivity um, as a society, productivity, you know, in, in, uh, in our jobs, uh, even productivity uh, at home, having more time to spend doing the things we want to do, not necessarily doing the things that we have to do. And then innovation, um, and I agree with Peter, this been sort of plat plateau and growth, plateau and growth. Interesting, uh, in our business uh, for the last, you know, 80 years, 100 years around the energy efficiency game, is that uh, about every decade there really is a leapfrogging in technology and, and you know for us it's some pretty basic technologies you know compression and heat transfer and controls but what's been different is that holistically as a system you think about the algorithms to do things the algorithm the algorithms to, to control systems and manage uh, complex uh, buildings facilities installations uh, that systems thinking has evolved and i would say most the Efficiency gains and productivity have come out of the systems thinking as opposed to a component or, or, or product thinking. So, I'm not answering your big question, which is right up there with world hunger and everything else. <laughs> and by the way, I do know if we can improve the transport of food in India, where, you know, I mean, 80% uh, of the food harvested in India never makes it to the market, yet people are starving. I mean, they're a very uh, simple problem to solve relative to putting in place a cold chain mm -hmm. uh, to get uh, you know, food uh, to the market uh, fresh and healthy. I mean, so even problems like world health, you know, have to be solved on a practical level, uh, pragmatic level, um, and many of the solutions are out there today. Again, it becomes a prioritization for uh, sort of what's important to uh, the governments, what's important to uh, sort of the uh, social environment that we live in. Uh, today is an example, and I feel like, uh, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time in Washington. Uh, Democrats and Republicans are fighting. Uh, whole administration thinks that every CEO is bad. Every CEO thinks that the administration is bad. Uh, it's a situation where it feels more than ever before it's a bit of a stalemate. And I don't think the elections in the fall are going to change much. There. There's got to be some fundamental change around leadership in, in taking the high road to find more opportunity to, you know, uh, to reach consensus around some of these issues uh, to really get us off the dime here in the short run. Absolutely. That's great. Let me um, turn it over to the audience. And um, Eitan's had his hand up, and so I'd like to uh, call on him and uh, ask you to press on the button and hold on it while you're speaking. And if you can direct your question to either Peter or Mike or, or both, that would be really helpful. It was a <clears throat> short question for Mike. I wanted to know if you agree with Peter that uh, energy is underpriced globally? Yeah, I think it's the paradox. Uh, it is, I, I believe it is, uh, probably in the long run. Uh, of course, I, I think having the end game established in terms of what the overall system strategy is for energy is important. And I think that if we're having a tough time getting consensus, even on energy efficiency standards, you can, th you can, you can imagine the difficulty in consensus around sort of systems, uh, particularly globally, as they relate to the competitiveness between systems, even, either on a regional or national level. So, so I do, I do agree. I, I think it's uh, there's a short-term uh, issue that uh, is helped through energy efficiency. There's a long-term issue that needs to be resolved through uh, the systems thinking uh, that Peter talked about. Great. Uh, other questions or comments in the audience? Yes. Um. You know, let's see if this works. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I can't hear. No, no, hold it down. See. Yeah. It's the human side of technology again. <laughs> um, this this question is directed to both. Um, Mike, I think that the, the takeaway I got from you was engaged in the political process. And Peter, I think one of the takeaways to the last question was about the pricing, put the money on the table, so to speak. So I'm going to try and blend this question together. What would you say is the mechanism on the policy side to change the pricing? There's a lot of talk about you know, consumption or uh, tax, consumption taxes, if you will, or cap and trade. I'm just curious, from both of your perspectives, what would you? What are you advocating for from a policy and a pricing mechanism? Uh, Peter, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think first off, we have to remember the, the dilemma that Mike brought up, which is, in some sense, this is this is one of the aspects of this that are probably almost has to be global, has to be thought about in terms of the different realities, political context in the key global players. Um, and once you say that, you can easily throw up your hands and say it's hopeless, nothing's ever going to happen. I don't believe that. I think the big advantage we have right now is that people are becoming aware. I mean, we tend to look at the world, obviously we all look at the world through our own lens. As Americans, we think the world's paralyzed around climate change. That's not true. 
most of the world is actually relatively clear. You know, this is ultimately a bet. If, if it's wrong, you know, or if it's right, either way, there are big advantages of accelerating the transition to a defossilized energy system. Most of the world is reaching real consensus around that. And I think we can get very distorted by our media, we can get very distorted by, you know, looking at the wrangles going on in Washington. And, you know, this is a very simple situation in one sense. You know, the science is about as compelling as it will ever be. Science never produces certainty. That's not the way science works. It's very easy to make everybody feel like there's great uncertainty. There's relatively great certainty on the basics. Um, and most of the world is responding to that. I think actually once China starts to fill out, figure out its own policy regime, the U.S. will almost have to follow suit. Either that or it's going to face being the South Africa of the world. It's going to get more and more ostracized by virtue of having its head in the sand relative to the set of issues that most of the world is losing real consensus with. So in that sense, um, China's leverage is, is, is a kind of, I don't know if it'll be a cap and trade system, uh, they're going to have to, you know, the Chinese will want to come up with something that's very Chinese. So it's kind of hard for us to figure it out, but I think they're gradually starting to see it's, it's their game. The ball's actually in their court. Um, and they'll initially try to push this from the standpoint of innovation and business leadership, you know, as I was talking about the alternative energy uh, technologies. Uh, but eventually, they're going to wrestle with, you know, the price. You know, the price of gasoline is ridiculous in China, just like it's ridiculous here. Um, I, I, that was a place I would put the emphasis, actually. I would put it someplace where you and I, as individual consumers, have to change our thinking. So that obviously could be electricity as we get it out of the socket. It could be gasoline as we get it out of the car. The advantage of that is it puts all of us in the story. Where if you just focus on the price to the business, uh, you'll get a lot of leadership to business if you get the pricing right. But it won't necessarily filter out more widely. I think the 800 pound gorilla in most of the sustainability issues are usually the consumers, the relatively wealthy consumers in the world. So China will have to wrestle with this with their growing middle class. I, I think one of the things that, that I try to do, I know, in terms of any decision that I make or, or how I would look at an issue is to, is to have the right uh, point of view around me, the right diversity of thought around me in terms of the kinds of uh, people and input and the fact base that I take in. And ultimately, if I have to make a decision, it's, it's having that complete set of fact based around me. Um, a great example is after the healthcare uh, reform bill was announced, uh, companies had to take very large charges, uh, just actuarial charges, uh, to be compliant with uh, gap accounting. Um, I was in Washington a couple of days after that, meeting with various legislators on other issues, and the topic came up because we had just announced our charge. And I was actually explaining to legislators that voted for the bill the very, very basic economics of why and how it impacted uh, corporations. So what you saw was uh, some folks that uh, were clearly you know, voting on party lines or around populist opinion that didn't understand the fact base um, as it pertained to that particular issue. I think this is an issue like that where you, you've got to look at that diversity of thought around decision makers and policy makers. And I think it, you know, to take some proactivity on our part, it's around being sure that we're providing that fact base. So the fact base isn't clear on all sides, and we have a point of view, point of fact, that is worth considering that that voice is actually heard. And um, it's a lot like uh, CEO speech making. You know, The only thing about that is sometimes you've got to say things a lot of times to get the change to be heard and understood or the fact base to be clear. So, I think that uh, we've got to keep pounding on these on these issues, pounding on different points of view, advocating uh, both from uh, from a university, an NGO, from a corporate perspective, uh, from an agency perspective on what we believe the fact base uh, to be, and making sure that the voice is heard and part of the consensus going forward. Can't give you an opinion on what the right price of fuel should be. We really don't, I say, particularly engage in that. We just want to reduce the demand side of that equation as opposed to focus too much on the supply side. I know that's a great question. Other questions or comments? Yes. Morning. Thank you guys for <clears throat> for being here. It's uh, interesting, and I'm I'm sorry I'm going to go back to pricing for for a quick second, but I keep hearing um, you know passion and advocacy being important drivers here. Uh, I work in the hospitality industry, and we're you know we're quite behind versus Europe in terms of efficiency within our our buildings, um, and I I truly think ad advocacy and passion are important. 
but pricing is really the key, particularly here in the U.S. Conversation here today has been us versus China, really. Uh, and when you look at Europe and the price of utilities in Europe, there's a pretty big gap. Um, you know, uh, looking at DOE data, uh, you know, the average commercial rate is 50% less in the U.S. than what it is in Europe. How, is that sort of the, the something we should be looking at and paying attention to more instead of just focused on, on us versus China? We actually... You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, in fact, put a lot of our technology centers in Europe for that reason. That, you know, Europe leads... Uh, most of the research, most of what uh, you know, sort of we're looking at in our world around uh, refrigerants, alternative refrigerants, natural refrigerants that you know, power some of the technologies that we use in our business. And, and so we, we collected a lot of our technologists in Europe and, and are always uh, either developing their first or leading uh, sort of with, uh, with, with Europe in, in mind. Uh, you know, what you see there is, is very stringent uh, rules and policies and the Netherlands even around noise um, and, and uh, uh, sort of the decibel level that trucks can run at because uh, foods will linger in the evenings and so from a noise pollution perspective, the decibel level of the truck is going to be different in the Netherlands than it will be in other parts of Europe. Well, that forces us to create you know, platforms to deal with various kinds of, of, of uh, technology or pollution of any kind and then um, get the scale on that investment back through uh, proliferate that platform globally throughout the world, getting enough scale to make it economical across the world. Uh, if you can't get that kind of scale, though, and you can't initially usually get that kind of scale, uh, it creates a business center, you know, for you and ask how business to make a case, a business case around why the economics work for your investment versus an investment perhaps building a new, new hotel or whatever it might be. So I, I think there's got to be some scale. We're seeing some increase here, but there still is a, uh, a cost trade-off. Somebody uh, in, in a decision-making role in a corporation today that wants to make a decision around energy efficiency uh, has got to kind of take a leap of faith in the long run, take a long-term view, and take a view that uh, is uh, by nature more green or sustainable in nature. There, there still is a bit of a penalty uh, in terms of lowest first costs. You know, so we can really cross that, I don't think we're going to get uh, you know, huge traction. Peter, any uh Anything to add to that conversation? Uh, no, I think that John was really, did a really useful thing by getting us to, to look at Europe as well as China, India, and the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, in, in so many areas, um, Europe really is a leader. And, and it's good to ask the question, why? I mean, anyone who's lived in Europe for a long time realized they've accepted higher energy prices for a long time. Right? And, you know, they haven't died. I mean, it hasn't <laughs> now, they do bring their hands about their rate of growth, right? They generally say, well, you know, the European economy still grows rapidly. And I think that may be a real lesson in there. And it's not an easy lesson, as you pointed out before. One of the unchallengeable assumptions is that the rate of growth of any society should be the greatest rate. But of course, that's not true for anything in nature. Why should it be for our economy? One more uh, question from the audience. Yes. Um, this is a question for Dr. Senga. Can you hear me? All right. Um, so first, thank you for setting that holistic vision for us about the energy system of the future. I think that's going to be great as we go through the day. Um, my question is that, do you think that under current policy and incentive structures, the business sector can really make meaningful change towards the energy system of the future? Because it sounds like both you and Mr. Lamarck see policy as maybe more important before businesses can really act. So is there something businesses can do now, or do we need to fix the incentive structure before real progress can be made? Well, the incentive structure is a national incentive structure. You probably answer, can answer your own question. In other words, as I said before, how many of us want to wait until Washington gets its act together so that anything real can happen? We're going to wait a long time. You know, the paralysis and the, you know, extraordinary. I mean, Mike made the point just a little while ago, which I think we, we all have to take to heart as Americans. The extraordinary hyper-partisanship today in Washington it is incredibly dysfunctional. So that said, I mean, we have to look at the reality of the situation. Um, Business has a couple of big advantages. One is it does operate on a global scale. I mean, it's a fundamental difference between someone like Mike and, and the senator, you know, from North Carolina. 
I, mean, I don't know the number today, but you know, it, it's a bizarre number, and I knew it five years ago. The percentage of the representatives in our in our Congress who had a passport. It was well below 50%. So there's just zero global perspective, widely distributed there. Whereas in business, there's an immense understanding that you've got the Europeans, you've got the Chinese, you've got the Indians. So, so the ability to look at these problems globally. Uh, secondly, business is the locus of innovation. So Mike said something a few minutes ago, which I thought was really you know, interesting. He said, well, we've got a 20-year kind of picture of our portfolio with a five-year time uh, planning horizon. Uh, that's probably pretty typical of most American companies. Uh, but in that 20-year portfolio picture, why couldn't there be a continual inquiry? What's the energy system we think that could emerge in China, India, Brazil, United States, Europe, our major market areas? I don't see anything that keeps people from asking that question. And then obviously the next question is, and the implications for us would be, what are some of the risks of what we're doing now? You know, one of the ways to get these issues in a meaningful way into board this conversations and businesses is you get a lot more sophisticated about risk. Uh, Mike, uh, Dan knows all about this because he saw how that really shifted Coca-Cola vis-a-vis understanding water issues in the world. They got much more sophisticated at looking at the risk to their business plans of water scarcity in dollars and cents, you know, real serious risk analysis. I would say the same thing. If you really start to consider significant decarbonization in India or China as a possible scenario, this is business now, as a possible scenario, and what's the risk to your 20-year portfolio plan, not on your capital spend, but your portfolio plan, um, of, of, um, of being wrong, you know, of this scenario versus this one. Businesses are usually pretty good at scenario analysis. The problem is it's being done in that five-year horizon. The challenge is to push it out to that 20-year horizon. It's a very fundamental leadership process issue. Um, and, and yet I, I think if businesses can't do it, I, I don't see who else will, frankly. Uh, I mean, businesses in concert probably with states and municipalities can kind of do this, but it's not going to happen in Washington. We're really being naive with this. I made a comment that CEOs are making decisions to not invest in the U.S. And I, I think it was maybe a month ago where Intel said that they were going to build a billion dollar fab plant but couldn't afford to build it in the U.S. And they were really citing it was, uh, it was trade, it was tax, it was energy, it might have been other kind of policy issues. Uh, the other CEO, the CEO that I know said that he assigns the highest uh, internal cost of capital to a project actually in the U.S. right now due to instability in, uh, around understanding you know, sort of how to think about the investment in a plant, which, you know, we're thinking 30 years from a built plant or, 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 or put infrastructure in place like, like that. Um, CEO of Emerson's been very um, vocal talking about uh, the fact that Lily Sal never put in place another U.S. job, okay? These are enormous companies, you know, great innovators that I think are stuck. And we're not to that point. You know, we're 70% we're of our employee base, which our revenue base is here in the U.S., um, you know, we're, we're, we're very committed to having made decisions like that, but I can tell you, it bothers me more and more every day to make investments with that uncertainty as to really where things go. Yet, it, it, it bothers me as a person, as an individual, to look at unemployment rates where they are and, and look at all the people we've had to lay off in the last 18 months. And, you know, there's a responsibility for families and for people that we have as well, too. And, and, and you can't, uh, can't break your heart. To, to read these things and see these things and hear these things about those kinds of policy issues affecting real families. And, and that's uh, it's, it's a heartbreaker. All right, with that, um, yeah, I'd just like to reinforce, I think what we've heard from both of our um, keynote speakers in the conversation today is one, a note of real aspiration and holistic mapping of this in the broader context of issues that we all care about. And I think that's really important to take into it. I also heard a real note of pragmatism, which is that we have to identify very concrete, specific um, steps that can make a difference to the organizations that we work in, um, that move us in the right direction, with an eye for that, that, that sort of far horizon, but with a real orientation to pragmatic steps that we can take today. I think that's the right balance that we want to take into the rest of the conversation today. I, I, I hope that this conversation is really queued up, and I, I, I feel enthusiastic about the kind of content that we've sort of laid out and discussed already today. We're going to make a transition in room, but we're also going to make a transition in tone. 
I want all of you to be really engaged, and we're going to try to create as much space for that as we can. I'll wrap now. We have about uh, 10 minutes to get from here over to Faculty Hall, and I think there'll be some that will lead you over there. The room is a little tight. Um, we're, we're fostering a sense of intimacy there. <laughs> so thanks very much, and thanks to Mike and Peter for leading us in a great conversation. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.